greetings again as uh, we look forward to this coming Sunday, a weekend. The uh, scripture readings chosen for our consideration are from the uh, prophet Jeremiah, the 20th chapter, from the letter of Paul, beginning with uh, chapter 12, the first two verses, and then, uh, of course, the Gospel of Matthew, beginning, uh, chapter 16, beginning at verses 21 through, well, 27, although 28 probably finishes uh, that sequence out. And the Gospel uh, continues the episode that we heard last week, where you remember when Jesus and his disciples are in the area of called Chesar Philippi, that he had raised with them the question, who do you say that I am? And they had responded, uh, well, John the Baptist, uh, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. In fact, one notices that often the gospel tradition of Matthew likes to make connections between that particular prophet, the prophet Jeremiah, and the teaching or mission of Jesus. Peter, of course, had remembered when asked that question, stepped forward and said, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And uh, Jesus had responded, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church, etc., etc." And so this important confession of Peter had concluded the uh, episode last week. The gospel this week picks that up, where Jesus now reminds the disciples, and as I mentioned in the, this gospel, the teaching of Jesus is now oriented as we move forward, rather exclusively to the disciples, rather than to people uh, at large. And Jesus now says, and this is the first of what are known as predictions of what is going to happen in the city of Jerusalem. In fact, three times Jesus will tell his disciples that as they go up to Jerusalem, things will not go so well. Uh, Jesus will be handed over, be betrayed, be executed, and on the third day, they or will experience resurrection. This pattern of three predictions of what is going to happen in Jerusalem was, we believe, first developed by the gospel writer Mark. And he uses it quite effectively. And uh, when we next year come to Mark, we can explore that a little bit further, but uses it quite effectively as a way of informing his disciples about what will happen when they come to Jerusalem. Well, Matthew does the same thing, although he will be much more gentle with his disciples as they are moving forward, seeing these, uh, this message of Jesus as an opportunity for them to grow in their faith. All right, so what does Jesus say? That uh, we are going up <clears throat> uh, to Jerusalem where uh, he will suffer, that would be Jesus, from the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, be killed and on the third day be raised. It's interesting to notice that in that little phrase, the Pharisees are excluded. So always, I've mentioned before, there's this tension, particularly in this gospel between Jesus and the Pharisees. There is also a similarity of teaching and an understanding. And when things begin to turn against Jesus, the Pharisees are often pictured as pulling away, not being so much a part of what will happen. Now, what happens here is that hearing these words, Peter, remember last week he proclaimed, you are the Christ, now says uh, to Jesus, in effect, um, look, you really don't want to do this, do you, Jesus? Now, it isn't that Jesus, that Peter rather, is a coward or that he is a short-sighted nationalist, but he is aware of the responsibility that goes with using the title Messiah. Does Jesus fully appreciate 
what expectations with regard to the term the Messiah are all about. In fact, one of the points, as the Gospel of Matthew continues, is to explain that Jesus' understanding of Messiah is very different from that which was often expected by the rest of the Hebrew community. Did many people expect that there would be a Messiah? Sometimes we make the automatic conclusion that all the Hebrews were looking forward to a Messiah. Not necessarily. Certain members of the Jewish community were looking for a Messiah. Others were more given to, well, as one of the phrases used today is, that's the way it is and we have to learn uh, to live with it. But there were groups who did expect, expect a Messiah and their expectations were not always the same. Some, for example, remembered that in the past, famous leaders had been considered messiahs. They had raised up armies, God had been with them, had liberated them from oppressors, and reestablished Israel as God's people, able to be free and to rule themselves. That might have been a popular expectation of messiah that floated in Jesus' time. Now, exactly which groups expected that, we're not sure. We are, for example, knowing that there was a group down at a place called Qumran, down at the Dead Sea, <clears throat> where the group of Jews there believed that there would be two messiahs, that there would be a messiah, <clears throat> excuse me, that would help their community, and that there would be another Messiah who would help the rest of the Hebrew people. So to automatically assume in biblical, in Jesus' time, it would be biblical times, that there was a clear understanding of Messiah and what people were looking for would probably be not correct. Of course, we as a church, as time has moved on, in seeing Jesus as the Messiah, have not really paid much attention to or seen much need for consideration of those earlier views. But when now Peter says to Jesus, <clears throat> Uh, this is not going to work so well. Um, in effect, he, he knows the hopes and fears, as they say, of all the years. And, and he picks this title uh, to be shaped according to expectations of the community of many peoples. Here Jesus is going to say, that's not the way it's going to be. Now his response to Peter is, Satan, you are Satan, get behind me. Now, of course, <clears throat> Satan, I may have mentioned this before, is an interesting character. Uh, earlier on in this gospel, Jesus had been, you remember, in the, in the, de in the uh, desert um, for 40 days, and there the devil had tempted him, had tried to get him to look at how he might use his power in a way that would illustrate indeed his claim to be or the claim of those that he was the Messiah. And again, Jesus had rejected it. So this isn't the first time, carefully listening to this gospel, that we get a clue that things with Jesus, his expectations, his teaching were not the same as those that many were looking forward to. Get be Satan, you are Satan. Now, Satan here can be, and it will often be, equated with the devil. But Satan as such, with the capital S you remember, had placed an interesting role in earlier times. He is introduced in the book of Job. Now, you may remember that the book of Job, very important uh, writing in the Old Testament, perhaps one of the best and finest works of Hebrew literature in the Bible. Pictures as the book begins, God sitting up in heaven with the heavenly court and pointing out to them how down there on earth, my servant Job is such a wonderful guy, so faithful, so loyal. And now comes on the scene Satan whose job it was to kind of patrol the world, that is, earth down here, for the Lord and go back and give a report. Well, now, God says to Satan, 
You see Job down there? He's the example that everyone should be following. And Satan says, well, God, if everything were going as wonderful as it is for him, lots of money, lots of family, good health, why wouldn't he thank you and praise you and keep your way? And God says to Satan, you can go and test Job because I'll bet you. It's an interesting little opening where God makes a bet with Satan that he will remain loyal. My point would be is Satan is introduced here as one who tests another. And so here, Peter is told, you are like Satan, you're testing me, and that's not an important thing for you to do. But it's not that he's calling Peter kind of the devil or anything like that, but he is equating him with the tester. And remember earlier on that when the question had been posed by Jesus, who do people say that I am, they had answered John the Baptist, Jeremiah. Both of those prophets had experienced very difficult times and often were rejected. Now, in the, the reading for this coming week, there is a little section from Jeremiah 20, verse 7 through 9, where Jeremiah is pictured as saying to God, you know, God, you duped me. It's an interesting phrase. You used me. Now, as the book of uh, Jeremiah had begun, God had said, I knew you in your mother's womb before you were born, and I called you to be for me a prophet to the nations. But also understand that in your role, you will not be accepted uh, very readily by many. Jeremiah had, as we know, the longest period of being a prophet, perhaps almost 40 years. He had prophesied to Israel the difficulty that if they did not change their ways, they may well lose the sacred places that they were accustomed to. They did. Jeremiah is um, later on sent into exile with his people and uh, finishes his years there uh, as a ma man, really who brings hope at a time in which they are suffering. But here, Jeremiah, in this little section that's quoted for our consideration, raises doubts. Doubts whether or not the mission that God has given him is really worthwhile, whether God is just using him, especially because uh, the leader of the temple, at this point in time, the temple in Jerusalem still stood, a man named Pissar um, had punished Jeremiah for what he had done. He then had been led off by Bab the Babylonians uh, into exile, and um, his whole uh, uh, kind of way of dealing things was use torture and punishment. And so Jeremiah is pictured as saying in this little section that we hear, maybe it's better if I just say nothing. Why should I say something that's going to get me beat up? People aren't going to listen. I'll just be quiet. But Jeremiah says, no, the love of God's word, the love of God's message needs to be proclaimed, and I cannot remain uh, silent. So that, I think, is one of the reasons why that little section from Jeremiah is offered for us uh, this week, as now Jesus tells uh, Peter that uh, as much as uh, you may be concerned here, that's not the way in which things will be uh, spelled out. Now, Jesus then says, and here, of course, I, I quote words that uh, you probably have heard many times, perhaps one of the more quotable sections of the whole New Testament that many, many, particularly Catholics, are familiar with. Namely, whoever wishes to come after me, says Jesus, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to lose their life, whether whoever wishes to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. What profit? Does one gain 
if it gets the whole world and forfeits their life. Now, take up your cross and follow me. We perhaps do not get the full impact of that particular statement. People in the first century world knew well the meaning of the cross or crucifixion. We perhaps do not have that same sense. Many, many, even in the Galilee in which Jesus had lived, had seen the cruelty of the process of execution employed by the Roman government. Now, uh, Rome often, by the way, used crucifixion as a way to kind of say to people, this is what happens to you if you don't follow our ways or if you go against uh, the empire. So for example, as I may have mentioned, around the year six of the common time, well, when Jesus would have been perhaps just a, kind of a young boy, a rebellion had broken out in uh, uh, the city of Sipporah, a little bit, of, about four miles or so, the other side of Nazareth, and it had been put down by the Romans. And so the story goes, they executed uh, many, many Jews by crosses all along the road uh, leading up to that city and away from it. So people were well aware of what crucifixion was like. And uh, I think many of you probably are familiar and we have a lot more um, evidence about crucifixion in our time, uh, information about it than we had before. It was, first of all, a public execution. And that was part of why the Romans did it this way, because what it did was shame a person. And by the way, the crucified person was put on the cross with no clothes on. Later on, Christianity, for all kinds of reasons, we do uh, kind of cover certain parts. But shame really was, there you were, really exposed. There's nothing pleasant about that. So all the pain, the blood that dripped down caught people's uh, uh, attention. Death by crucifixion, as you remember, so we kind of uh, know, was pretty much by asphyxiation. You did not die quickly. In fact, most people who were executed probably hung on the cross anywhere from uh, two days to a week, depending on the ability of the person to stay alive. And uh, on the cross, the, the pressure, you remember, was uh, that as you hung there, uh, now usually they would put a little wooden block uh, on the beam of the cross. By the way, the, the, the main piece, the vertical piece that went up like this, always remained in place. So there were special places of crucifixion, except, as I mentioned before, when they had multiple crucifixions, well, then they had to, to make, them, uh, make them up as they went along. But as the person hung on the cross, either with his hands uh, tied to the cross or perhaps with a nail placed to the uh, wrist here, which the Romans discovered there was a bone which held a person's hand. Otherwise, if you put it through the palm, it would have just ripped out. So even some of our uh, pictures that we pretty much regularly use uh, are more artistic than they are, uh, as I say, the way it really happened. That's why I say in the first century world, people knew how painful and how cruel crucifixion uh, was. And as I say, as the person hung on the cross, uh, his hands would sag, uh, his uh, lungs would uh, fill up, uh, so in order to uh, get it off, he would have to push up again, therefore uh, exhale, but the pain of standing on, on the nail or whatever was holding him up was too much, and so he would sag again. So it was a painful, painful uh, death, but as I say, the, re the rationale for it was that it humiliated a person, it uh, indicated uh, that they were being rejected by uh, the government and by others in authority. It was a kind of taunt. If you do this, see what will happen to you. So 
When Jesus now says one needs to take up their cross and follow me, uh, the cross that he has mentioned is not that, and, and not that this isn't important, and not that it doesn't get uh, a great deal of homiletic and kind of uh, religious reflection as centuries go on, but the cross here is not to take up each day's difficulties, the different pains and sufferings that we have to put up with. Yes, those certainly can be seen as a cross, but the cross here that Jesus is referring to is to take up the message that I am teaching, the message of messiahship that we are uh, trying to uh, live out. So it's this message, not self-denial that Jesus is talking about, um, certainly that's important, but rather the ability truly to follow in Jesus' way and to carry the cross. Now, just as back logging just a moment here, as a person was led to crucifixion, they did have to carry their own cross, which would have been the horizontal part of the cross, not the whole cross, again, as our stations and some of the other uh, pictures of crucifixion. And that's all important to keep that in mind. All I'm just saying as we look at this is what would be the understanding of the New Testament community that Matthew is addressing and the people of his time who knew what crucifixion was and why it was something that one would be very cautious about uh, too readily uh, embracing. So, um, take up the cross, follow me. Well, Jesus, and, and you can now see rather, I, I guess I would just add, you can, can just see why Peter would have uh, kind of advised Jesus that maybe this isn't the way you want to go and certainly not the way we want to go. Now again, notice that this whole uh, story of Jesus written by Matthew is produced at least 50 years after the time of Jesus. So in writing or portraying his portrait of Jesus, uh, the gospel writer Matthew knows what had happened to Jesus and knows the difficulties that he had experienced as he came to Jerusalem. So uh, when you write something in hindsight like that, looking back, you can certainly incorporate certain things into, uh, into the story, which raises the question, did Jesus know what was going to happen to him? Now, if you think about it, the way in which the gospel portrays and taking these words that we hear in the a passage of this week, it seems that Jesus does. Well, did he know exactly all of the things would have happened to him? But it is perhaps historically correct to assume that Jesus was not unaware that the things he was doing the way in which he was doing things and the sayings he was articulating would reach the ears of those in authority, would reach the ears of those whose expectations of Messiah maybe were even wrong. Perhaps when Rome heard that Jesus was being proclaimed as the Messiah, thought we've got to be careful of this man because he might be leading a revolution against the government. So did Jesus know, and he didn't have to be necessarily a, a, a mind reader or even, and I could be very careful here, but you did not even need to be divine to know that if you kept doing and saying the things that you did, you may well be moving yourself into a situation in life that would not be so healthy for you. So that's why I do mention that as a part of the gospel today. Now, uh, the rest of the gospel, of course, nicely, perhaps is a little bit of a homiletic reflection on the part of Matthew to his community, that we, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel, will be able to put all things into perspective 
because of it. It doesn't mean that everyone would be expected to die, that everyone would be expected to lose uh, their property or their livelihood, but it did mean that things would uh, perhaps be uh, a, a little bit or a little bit different or there was a danger here. So before we're too quick with to say to Peter, you're wrong, maybe we would have advised Jesus if we had stood there, maybe you don't really want to do that because and, uh, we, if we follow you, might find ourselves in similar or difficult circumstances such as uh, this. And by the way, when the victim was arrested and sentenced to uh, crucifixion, no one acted to protect the victim without bringing on themselves the uh, list to be a candidate for crucifixion. So you see, one of the uh, kind of issues there was when you saw this, maybe the wise thing to do, the prudent thing to do, was to say nothing. Now remember the words of Jeremiah, I've been duped, I'm going to say nothing. Well, then he says, but I can't just do that. And so the Christian, uh, particularly as Matthew's community looks at it, might have to say something uh, in behalf of the values that they believed in. So what can one give for exchange of their life? And thus, uh, what I'm saying today is this might be the historical context of Matthew's gospel. As we use these words to help our Christian life develop over the centuries, it is important to see that we can adapt them and adapt them to the needs that, uh, that we have. Uh, just as a, a conclusion uh, a thought today, the first, uh, second reading rather, is the opening section of chapter 12 of uh, the letter of Paul to the Romans. We mentioned uh, that it's divided into three parts. This is the opening part, but uh, it's only two verses, and uh, I did uh, kind of bring it along. Uh, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern the will of God. Now. What does Paul mean here when he says, do not conform yourself to this age? I think it's important to notice, and I've mentioned this about a number of other uh, New Testament uh, passages, that Paul understands the world in which he was a part. What was the culture and the uh, kind of heady messages that were coming around in Paul's time? Do not, he says, conform to those. But there are different circumstances in our world. And I mention this because with the development of science and technology, there are new ethical challenges that were never part of the uh, time and places that Paul and the community at Rome were um, available at. We will look at this a little bit further in the next week or two uh, from the conclusion of the letter of Paul to the Romans, but I did want to point out here that Paul's advice pertains to his own time and place, and he does say, use your head about these things. And the you here, you use your head, is the English plural you. So it isn't simply, and although you could certainly make that case, and many have uh, done that, use your conscience. But uh, it seems, and here the Greek is important to notice, if that's where the translation came from, that the you Paul is referring to is the community. You look at these issues together. And we will see then how he kind of follows this through uh, in the rest of the uh, letter uh, to the Romans. But as I said, uh, that uh, Roman letter kind of is separate from the uh, first and uh, third readings today. So with Peter, we uh, certainly say you are the Christ for us, you are the son of the living God, and uh, we uh, are reminded by Jesus, don't put behind me 
those good things, but let me lead you into those good things. So have a good week. It's nice that you were with us today.